Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our coverage of HFES 2018. My name is Nick Rome. I'm joined by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. And today we have Sylvan Bruni and Marilyn Mobley from the diversity panel. Uh, that was the plenary session today. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So, so uh, look, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on with diversity right now. You know, you have the Me Too movement, um, lots of political things going on right now. And I think this is a really important topic to discuss. So diversity pervades more than just human factors. It's across all industries. And I think let's kind of just talk about it. I, personally, for me, as a white male, I don't know what I can do to be an ally. And uh, is there anything? Let's start there, right? Like, Well, I, I'm glad you, you care. <laughs> So number one is to care enough to want to be an ally. Uh, number two, I think it's all of us need to be more educated about what we mean by diversity or sometimes having a common sense of terms or understanding. So at the university, I work at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. And for us, it's important to talk about the whole breadth of human differences. So the breadth of human differences is around race and class and ethnicity and language and religion and sexual orientation and ability. So to be able to say that first is important. Second, to be able to say um, we also need to pay attention to the very obvious ones that create the most problems for us. The, I want to say challenges, not problems. So race, gender, and class, and sometimes religion tend to be in your face issues that we struggle with. And so sometimes it's about talking to people who are not like you and to be courageous enough to say, I don't know enough, I'd like to know more, uh, without making people feel as if they are specimens. <laughs> and that's something that you talked a little bit about the diversity panel, about like the sustained dialogue movement that actually provides like a space or a kind of forum you can go and actually talk about these issues. Because I know a lot of times it's being scared to even broach the subject, right? Whether it comes to religion or race or whatever it may be. That's right. So sustained dialogue, um, we are a sustained dialogue campus, but it started at Princeton, and it grew out of how conflicts could be resolved in international diplomacy by getting people to stay in the room together. And so we believe sustained dialogue and training people how to be facilitators, how to talk through difficult issues is part of the first step of how to become an ally. You know, to be interested and care enough to hear... Tell me more about your story. What is it like for you to navigate this particular space or this particular culture or this particular organization? What is it like for you to navigate? Because sometimes when you're in a privileged position, you don't know what it's like for people to navigate who are not privileged. And so sure. sustained dialogue is a facilitated form of dialogue where you allow people to hear one another's stories, not just their stories, but their experiences and, and, and their aspirations. You know, what would you like to see? Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And so sometimes it's about what would you like to see happen differently in our organization? Because if you're in a privileged position, you think everything is fine. <laughs> and if you're not in a privileged position, you have a lot of complaints. And so having that kind of conversation is helpful. Most definitely. And yeah. engineers have a background in problem solving. So sometimes once you know the issue, then you can say, okay, this is what I can bring to the table to resolve it. Now that I know what your issues are, maybe I can help. Right, Sylvan, you are an engineer. I am right? an engineer. And why don't you let everybody know here what you're representing and uh, what kind of challenges you face. So I'm representing Boston Pride, which is the nonprofit organization in Boston that plans and produces all of the uh, gay pride celebrations, LGBT pride in Boston, year-round events. And we do, obviously, Pride Week with a big parade and, and festival, just like most prides. But we also have very specific programs like Black Pride, Youth Pride, Latinx Pride, um, to support and amplify the voices of parts of our community that have been typically disenfranchised or not represented enough. Um, and so in addition to that, you know, you asked 
in the very beginning, you know, what can you do? Um, I would say the first step is, yeah, educate yourself. Go out, seek those resources, and look at what organizations are doing. Um, our organization publishes a pride guide, which is both about the events that we plan, but also about the very specific topics that are affecting the LGBT community. And this is where we tell our stories that otherwise we would not be hearing about. And I think it's, it's very good for people to just read those and get that little by little understanding of what issues people who are not like you might face. Sure. So I want to I want to touch on that education piece because there's literature out there that would suggest that perhaps education does not necessarily equal change. I mean, you know, just sort of telling somebody that something is a problem might not lead to the problem being solved, right? And that's something that I'm sure you both have experienced. Um, and so what, in addition to education, can we sort of do to help facilitate others to, to yeah, that's, take action? That's a good question. I'm, I'm in education. I'm a big proponent of education. I always have been under the impression that education does lead to change. So I appreciate you saying that, uh, <laughs> disavowing me of my illusion. Uh, but I, but I, I think it does begin the change. But I think um, helping people learn how to be engaged. So civic engagement is often the next step. You know, it's one thing to be better educated about a particular group. It's another thing to say, I want to be engaged with that group. I want to be part of the solution to the change. You know, being the change you want to see is the famous um, quote that people like to say. So I think that's the next step. If, if you care and you've gotten better educated, then the next thing is to roll up your sleeves to say, how can I be involved? How can I be engaged? If, if we want to see change, I don't think it's education for education's sake. Right. You know, so if it's education for education's sake, that's a non-starter. But if it's education for the sake of contributing and for creating, uh, for one thing, more access to other people, you know, the, the field of engineering, I know as the chief diversity officer, needs more diversity in it. So it's one thing to say, oh, I know they need more diversity. It's another thing to say, who can I mentor? What schools can I visit? What um, organizations can I reach out and talk about the field of engineering, for example? So I think education requires action if you care, if you're committed to, to change, or if you see the need for change. Yeah, I, absolutely. You know, I think the education is a necessary step to get started, but then you have to be, to get involved, and you have to spend the time and the energy and the effort, and sometimes your own money and donate and, and support those the causes and the organizations that are on the ground um, making the change actually happen. You know, speaking from a, a nonprofit side. We always need more volunteers. We could use more people to participate. And it's not hard. You know, we have different kinds of volunteer positions for every levels of skills and abilities. And, and we welcome anybody um, because we want everybody to be in the room, um, including people who may not necessarily identify with the community, but who want to be ally, right. allies. And, that, and that's a key voice to make sure that after the meeting at the Pride Committee is over, things go back elsewhere and other people hear about it and realize how important it is and how much change can actually happen by being there and doing the work. I feel like that's really important for our listeners or anybody to really hear too. It's, is the education piece is very important, right? Because you want to at least know that there is some kind of problem. But like right. you just brought up, Sylvia, and I think the best way you can get involved in any kind of cause or any getting a better understanding of any issue is volunteering with people. To really, because that also starts that word of mouth. Like this is something mm -hmm. I've done. These are the proactive steps I've taken to try and counteract a cause. So that's great. Exactly. Right. And I also think it's about what kind of education, because the education that helps us understand how we're interconnected is the best kind. I think if it, if the education is just I need to know more information about that group, and you don't get education that says there are ways you're already connected to that group that you may not have known, or there are ways that what happens to that person is connected to your well-being in ways you may not have known, then it's beyond just, you know, right. a, a certain bucket of information. It's, it's about the interconnectedness of information. That's sure. what I'm learning. I mean, I'll just give you a funny example. I travel a lot for the university, and I always say every time a plane goes up in the air and comes back down, 
I know I need to thank a group of engineers, not just one engineer. There's a bunch of engineers who are responsible for planes working successfully. And, and we can take that for granted. You know, you get in line and you're mad that the plane's late or delayed or whatever. But I think the fact that you can go up in the air and you know you didn't do it and come back <laughs> right. down. I mean, I think education that helps us understand our interconnectedness is the, the kind that I'm thinking about. That's wonderful. And that kind of goes back to sort of this circle of uh, mentorship that you were talking about during the panel. I was hoping that you could elaborate a little bit more on that for maybe listeners who are unfamiliar. I was certainly unfamiliar with the concept. Traditionally, it's been very master-student kind of Right, right. So the whole idea of mentor circles is to move beyond the idea that you have one mentor who can make or break your career. And in graduate school, people know how tenuous that can be if you have oh, sure. if, if you have a relationship with your mentor that's really supportive it, all systems go but <laughs> if you have a breakdown in that communication you can feel like oh, oh I'm not going to get my degree because my mentor doesn't like my project or we we have a disagreement you know there are issues around diversity that have to do with people crossing boundaries you know people decide they want to be more than a mentor they want to be a friend of a particular kind and so those are problems so when problems emerge if that's your only mentor then you're you're stuck you have no and backup. so the goal is to have a circle of mentors some that you can go to I'm thinking of engineers I'm an English professor by training but someone you can go to for your discipline someone you can go to who is just there to be your friend when you have a difficult day someone you can be mentoring uh, so the mentor circle should be both people you're getting mentor mentoring from and people that you're mentoring and it gives you a greater sense of how to be a resource in your field great uh, do you have something to add there, Sylvan? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, especially when you, when you explore the intersectionality of, of identities of people, um, not one single mentor may be able to relate with you and to understand your complete full self. So having a series of people who you can turn to to explore those things. And, you know, I've been a mentor uh, with HFES now, and, and it's interesting to see how um, things changed and how people are obviously a lot more open to having the conversations that we didn't have before uh, but for students for example when they join the society and they come they have a lot of questions about how much of their identity they can express when they are here in what is considered to be a professional setting um, and especially you know with the LGBT angle uh, you know when we come to questions of, of gender expression, you know, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. And so those are, are deep questions that you need more than one person of, in your support network to address. That's, That's right. And yeah. it also helps to have the mentoring circle be a diverse group. Exactly. So my, my mentor was my dissertation advisor, a white male, and I'm a black woman. And, and yet I have mentors who are black men, who are black women, and I'm mentoring people who are different backgrounds. And so I think it just it helps you to feel more educated actually to have different kinds of mentoring experiences so one thing that I because we have a younger audience right people that are either in grad school or maybe starting earlier in their career and I remember being younger and in grad school myself having a hard time figuring out how do I actually interact with people to be help find mentors or how do I approach people about it and this like circle of mentor idea is amazing I think it's a great idea and I think it's something that would be useful to me even now mm -hmm. but do you guys have tips or tricks or ways that you've gone and you know interacted with people that are basically your peers or even above that you've kind of started that conversation about becoming a mentor well the way we started we we are part of the NSF ACAP grant. We, um, Case Western is a lead institution. It's a $3.7 million grant that we share with six other institutions. And we brought all of their scholars to campus and all of our scholars. And we did kind of a, a fishbowl idea where you, I, I need another way of describing it. It's kind of like speed dating. So you just go around and you don't, you don't necessarily know who you will leave knowing better as a mentor but you at least get to know who else is in the room who's interested in finding a mentor. And that begins the process. So it starts with a very open group of people just walking around getting to know one another and you find out who needs a mentor and also who's interested in mentoring. And so that begins the process. And having multiple opportunities for that, I think, is part of how you get it. Because it is hard. I mean, some people are shy. Some people, you know, are not very outgoing. They don't want to get in a, another person's face and ask for anything. 
but having a, an opportunity like that where you kind of go around and meet people quickly and then change and meet other people quickly I don't like calling it speed dating, but <laughs> speed, mentoring. It's speed mentoring. Speed mentoring. Speed mentoring. Thank you. <laughs> speed mentoring. Now I'll go back home with that. There you go. And HFES has had for, for several years um, both formal and informal settings for that. So there used to be a, a session called speed networking. Uh, uh, and that was the way it was done, where basically you would move seats you know, every two minutes to talk to a different person and understand that. Um, and right now it has, um, in a number of technical groups, a specific call for mentors and mentees. So people who are actively seeking to, research, to, to get mentors um, to, to participate in it. And that's the way I, for example, I'm a mentor right now now for, for a graduate student um, in here. But I also agree that you need to go get outside of the realm of, of the, the society or your professional environment. Um, I'm originally from France and when I arrived in Boston, number one, I didn't know any gay people. And number two, well, although my school in, French, in France told me you're really good at English, I could not understand what people were saying in Boston. Strong accent. And so I needed, you know, some support outside of the university to get up to that. And so actually the Pride organization that I joined, Boston Pride at the time, was a way to get to, with people who are local, so do you understand where I'm coming from and what I'm doing? And they really became my second family um, outside of the university to provide that support network, uh, both from the LGBT perspective, both from the immigration, immigrant perspective for me. So I'm glad he mentioned that because I also think mentor circles <clears throat> should include community people. Um, they don't all have to be inside the organization where you are. So including community people also broadens your horizons to understand different people from different walks of life can also mentor you about different aspects of your life and about your career. So I know we can't solve all the world's problems in a 20-minute podcast, but I want to close out with uh, if, if some of our listeners may be interested in getting involved with um, being an ally, if, if they're not one of these marginalized groups, or if they are, you know, where can they go for some resources? Well, um, at the university, I recommend that they come to the Case Western website and click on diversity. We have lots of um, resources there. We interact with our Women's Center, our LGBT Center, our um, Latinx community, the African American Society. We have a Black Student Union. I recommend that you go to our website and see the different groups that are there. And people can reach out to me and I can share other resources. Um, There's so many people talking about diversity now that there are lots of resources, but um, what we found at the university is bringing people together is one of the ways, and then having people share the resources that they're using to get the work done. And so I would recommend that website as a place to begin. And Sylvan? And so from my perspective, I would say if you want to be an ally, you know, go and read some of the resources that we have on our website at bostonpride.org. In particular, as I mentioned, our Pride Guide that has a lot of information and a lot of articles on specific topics for our community. That's at bostonpride.org slash guide. And after that, you know, volunteer and get involved and look for the Pride organization in your city. Reach out to them and say, hey, I'd like to help out and then see, see what happens. And then obviously you can do that with multiple communities. You can reach out to all of the other organizations that support um, the diversity of your, uh, within your region. Yeah, I just want to add, there's the National Society of Black Engineers, the National Society of Hispanic Engineers. I'm a board member for the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. And uh, there's also magazines like Diversity Inc. Um, you know, so there are places where you can begin your learning if you want to know more about the field. Excellent. And you guys are both on LinkedIn. So if anyone's interested, they can follow your work there. Marilyn Mobley and Sylvan Bruni, thank you so much for being on the show today. Sincerely, this has been a really great conversation. We, we could talk about this for days. So the way we like to end our podcast is we say it depends because it really does depend on the human and it especially depends when it comes to diversity. So on the count of three, we'll just say it depends and we'll be out of here. Ready? Three, two, one. It, it depends. depends.